I think we should probably go ahead and start. And uh, while we're starting, I want to take a minute. My colleague Fazilla is here, and she and I will be presenting to you tonight. And we just want to share with you a little bit about the program in case there's someone here that is unfamiliar with the program. And then I'll pass it to Fazilla. And Fazilla is going to give you an, all the secrets and the tips and tricks to have a very successful application. So, so thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. So as a brief overview, if you're not familiar with Asia School of Business, Asia School of Business began, if you will, as a marriage between Bank Nagara and MIT Sloan in the US. Um, it was at the time that uh, Bank Nagara was, um, had uh, Tantri Dr. Zeti as their governor, and she went looking to, to build a world-class business school in Malaysia. So here's a quick timeline, because we're a relatively new class, and where the idea of this came from was in 1998. Because when she went through and she was working very closely with a lot of the leading businesses here, and some of them due to financial and um, what was happening economically, they ended up replacing several managers. And what she discovered was that Malaysia had great talent, but they didn't have a deep bench strength. And her goal was to build a bench strength because what Malaysia needs to continue to grow and to continue to succeed is a strong bench strength of leaders to continue to grow the country. And this also applies to Asia as well, but her heart and focus was very much on developing Malaysian leaders. So with that, the first thing she initiated was the ECLIP, which was a governance and leadership institute. And then she worked and met with several business schools and ended up meeting and deciding to go with MIT Sloan who she asked to be involved with the program because of this a concept called action learning, which MIT Sloan is famous for, which is basically where you work with companies, you apply your learning, and you have truly live projects that are meaningful and have um, strong outcomes. So MIT eagerly got on board, and this is the first school that they've actually built from the ground up. Before, MIT's had some partnerships that once they've already started, but this is truly the heart of MIT's DNA. They put a lot of leadership in here, and they've also put in, made certain that the oversight is very strong to make certain that it is truly rigorous and MIT quality, since it bears their name. In 2016, we admitted our first MBA class, and we also broke ground on a new campus. And in 2019, we launched our MBA for Working Professionals program based off of the success that we had had running the full-time program. And our new campus literally just opened this January. So we're super excited to welcome everyone to campus as soon as everything is open and we're allowed to actually host guests. So as I mentioned before, we hope we have two MBA programs, okay? And they're, they're designed for completely different audiences. So our full-time program is truly an all immersive program where you're expected to be fully engaged 100% of the time. It's focused toward career shifters and changers. So if you want to change careers, this is a really good fit. And it's ready for people that want to fully immerse in their studies without further distractions and looking to, uh, to explore and develop all aspects of growth. Now, our MBA for Working Professionals program is designed for professionals who already are in their career, love their career, and want to accelerate their growth. So it's as we uh, you're required to actually already be working and be working while you do the program. So we assume that even if you eventually want to change roles, that you love the industry that you're in, or if you want to change industries, you love the role that you're in, so that you could do the same thing in a different industry. So it's you, but it's also ideal for people that already have families or that need to balance and still maintain their jobs for whatever personal reason it might be. And, but it also takes a lot of commitment as well, because you do have to have a supportive um, community and support from your company to be able to succeed in the program. And then of course, it's also with time and flexibility and the contract that you write with your family or significant others with you to allow you to do the program. So here's a quick look at the differences between the program. At the end of the day, you graduate with a master's of business administration. It doesn't matter which format you do, so you really pick the format that's best for you, okay? 
So in the full-time program, you cannot be employed. Or in the working professionals, you need to be employed. The average year's work experience officially for admissions is the exact same requirement. You need two years and above. But on average, the work experiences are slightly different. And that's just because people come to us at all stages of their career. It's designed for career accelerators. And for the residential component, instead of living full-time on campus, working professionals live in their normal life. And then when it's time for residency, they come to campus and they're a student while they're on campus. And then they'll step away and return to the regular lives again. You still have action learning. It's just in a different format. And we use practicums to balance out to make certain that both classes have the exact same learning when they graduate. So whether you do an intensive one week practicum or you do a semester long immersion project, the skills and takeaways are still supposed to be the same and the learning objectives are still the same. You have the option of doing a US or China trek, which actually we'll call these global treks for right now because of COVID, we may have to change the destination. Both groups still do MIT Sloan's four week immersion which we can talk about a little bit later, but it's where you get to spend four weeks at MIT Sloan. The working professionals can divide this two weeks in year one and two weeks in year two. If you have little ones that you can't leave behind for a month or if for work, it makes it difficult to get away for a month. And the total number of credit hours needed to graduate are different. However, working professionals can take as many electives and classes as their time permits. So if your schedule allowed you, we strongly encourage you to take more classes and you can certainly graduate with more credit hours. You're not limited to this. And here's a general look at the curriculum. Both programs, whether it be full-time MBA or working professional, have the same set of core classes. And then uh, the electives, there's nuances in the electives. The offerings are exactly the same, but working professionals are required to take a couple less. You both have the Sloan Immersion, and you have the learning and action that's very unique to your program. And most MBAs come through, the students focus on what we call a general concentration. But courtesy of the fact that we've launched a master's in central banking this year, and we've hired some outstanding faculty members to teach in finance, and we've also recruited several from Sloan that will come and teach. Any class that's not directly requirement of knowledge of central banking, we've tried to create a pathway for our MBA students to also take. And as a result of this, we've been able to create a finance concentration so that you're able to take some of these advanced finance classes and really drill deep if you wish to become an expert in finance. Otherwise, the curriculum is the same. It's all in the electives that you choose. And one thing that sets us apart, especially in the working professional program, is a focus on academic and professional development, in particular the professional development side, okay? So at ASB, you will see the smart and sharp skills everywhere. Anything when you look at us from our website to when you talk to our faculty members. And the reason behind this is you would have heard the terms soft and, um, soft and hard skills. But the thing is with that statement of soft and hard skills is that soft skills seem to get underrated. But yet when you look at why people get significant promotions, at why people are considered by their management to get into senior management, why they're trusted to lead departments, why they're trusted to lead firms. It's because of what we call the smart skills. These are the nuanced things that you learn through doing, through critical thinking, through growing emotionally, through um, ethics and empathy and visions and global mindset. And there's the list actually can go on and on. I think there's books written about it indeed. And then on the hard skills, it implies that you learn it once and you're done. But to be honest with you, when you get into technical skills, you have to keep refreshing and learning what's new or you fall quickly behind. So you can't learn it once and then forget it. So this is why we call it sharp and smart skills so that you continuously refresh and keep growing. And one of the things that we really focus on is teaching you how to learn, which sounds silly, but as part of a transformational program, it is one of the key things that you'll walk away with so you can continuously keep your skills sharp. And then of course, we will focus in very heavily on the smart skills. And in addition to what you complete in class, we also run workshops where you can attend and learn skills to help you gain what literally what companies are sending to executive education, we incorporate in the program. And as part of this as well, you also have access to executive coaching. And the executive coaches that our working professionals get 
are the same exact coaches that are, that are hired by the top leading companies in Malaysia to coach their own, their own um, leadership. So we have this thing that I mentioned called learning in action, which is where you take your learning that you learn literally in the classroom and you apply it to your job, and you apply it to your company. And the reason that it's so critical and the reason that Tantri Dr. Zetti was so much in favor of it and the reason she partnered with Sloan was specifically for this because you can learn and you can study from a textbook. You can even do homework assignments and you'll retain some, but you don't truly make it your own and understand it until the, you have actually applied it to your work. And so what learning in action does is you work with faculty, but you also work with business coaches and our business coaches are all MIT alums. They all have a consulting background. One of them is still in consulting. Others are heads of boards of directors of leading companies. But the goal is they really focus with you to show how to take those skills and make it applicable to your job and to your company to help you truly learn and get ahead. And a lot of these projects, while um, they may on the surface get you ahead in a little bit, but it also most of them what our students have found they've gained um, profiles and recognition within their company for being able to apply the skills start new business lines and fix problems that the companies have had for a while that maybe they didn't know how to fix previously. So the working professional schedule, this is the way it was designed. But of course, right now with COVID, we all know that what's designed and what's happening is not always the exact same thing, okay? So it was designed that you would come to campus, you would spend an intense week on campus, and then you would go back to your job and to your life. And when you were in your job in your life, you would still take time, you would do classes like on a Saturday morning or maybe a Tuesday evening you would have something, but the majority of the workload was carried in these residencies. However, with COVID, we have had to make changes simply because we have to take your safety first. So we prefer the in-person model and that is our goal and where we're hoping that we are fully focused in January. But for right now, what our plan is, is that we will launch an immersion where everyone is on campus. And then throughout the fall semester, we'll break up our um, learning things into a COVID version of these on residency, where we split it into two weeks, okay? And the classes are delivered by MIT faculty. So approximately 50% of your faculty come from MIT and approximately 50% of our own Asian School of Business faculty. And this is super important because the MIT faculty have the fame and the reputation and our faculty that we have at ASB have the work experience in Asia and know Asia. So it allows you to get dual lenses and see through both perspectives. But what we try to do with our MIT faculty is we'll have them in the evening across two weeks. The class times are from eight to 11 at night, but this does not mean that you can take the full day and work intensely and then take class at night. What this means is that here you would be taking an entire week out of work. Here we still expect you to take the same time, amount of time off, but it's spread across two weeks. So plan that about four hours a day, you're focused on preparing for class, doing homework assignments, and getting ready for your evening studies. The thing is why we place these classes in the evening is specifically for our working professionals so that you have the ability that you can plan if there's a critical meeting on Monday morning, you can make it or if there's a critical meeting or something that you must get done on Wednesday afternoon, you can plan your time schedule to be able to make it there as well. So this gives you more control of your schedule and picking when you take the time out to focus in on classes. And it doesn't mean that these are voiced over PowerPoints. What this means is it's truly, truly interactive. So a faculty member is engaged, he writes on the screen, he sees their pictures in front of him, he cold calls you, he works with you, you have classroom discussions. It is highly immersive. And I think the one difference that happens with the online classes is in addition to your immersion, then usually the chat is also buzzing where people add their comments and thoughts in the chat as well. So it gives you more ways to stay engaged and involved. And what the students have said is it's truly impactful. You still reach the same learning objectives and still get the same amount from the courses. It's just learning a different format. So. For right now with COVID, this is a model that we're, we're with during the normal, typical residency week outside of the immersion that's um, required for everyone to be here. And then we hope in January, we're back to our original schedule like this with the full immersion weeks, because we do really, truly do prefer in-person classes and interaction. Now, I wanted to give you a sample of a few of our students. 
Um, a few of these, actually three of them, just graduated literally on uh, the 22nd of May. We're super proud of them. And uh, Vin is one of our class reps in our current class that we have right now. But all of, the reason we highlight these four students is they all come from different backgrounds, okay? So Ideal is the CEO of a leading company, and he's used this program to really invest in the, in the company at work to figure out how to grow the business rapidly. And in fact, he just hit um, Malaysia's top 10 sales companies list that was published in The Edge and has been republished in other newspapers. Raphael is, an, is a uh, expat. He's based in Japan. And uh, he commuted in for the classes from Japan. Vin is based here. He's Malaysian. He's got an engineering background. And he works as an account manager for, uh, I, um, I think it's Hilti. I pronounce that correctly, that um, where he's actually on site and works very closely in the building and construction space. And Nick Aisha works with Sephora Group. Um, just before joining the program, she was CEO or uh, CFO of one of their subsidiaries. And then they've moved her up and she's received two promotions since. And now she's head of investor relations for uh, Sephora. So our students, have, each of them are different and unique, but each of them have figured out how to gain the most from the program and truly make it their own and to make it a valuable investment for them. And here's a look at our current student totals and the percentage of Malaysian versus international. And this doesn't mean that your class is gonna be 100% Malaysian focused because a lot of the classes, this approximately about 50%, you will actually take with the full-time program. And this is very important to you because the full-time program looks completely different stats wise. The full-time program is approximately 70% international. So when you take classes with our full-time program, you get the chance to learn sometimes from people that are maybe slightly more junior or more senior, depends on where they are when they decide to apply, but also from different cultures around the world. And literally, I think there is usually about 25 countries represented each year in the cohort. So uh, you get to learn from all of these diverse perspectives and learn to work with people globally. And in addition, you get to learn from different companies represented as well, because the working professionals all come from different companies. And the goal is that you share and you learn from each other. And if we actually run this program correctly, you learn as much from your classmates as you learn from your faculty. And so the campus that we mentioned to you, we have an excellent campus. Um, it was literally just built, it opened in January. And it is huge. It is uh, designed by MIT architecture to model the classroom size that is like MIT. So you get an MIT feel. And in fact, as I walk through there, I can see several similarities to MIT. But on the other hand, it's also very uniquely Malaysian and built by some of the top um, construction crews and uh, involvement with the top architecture firms in Malaysia as well. And then also residency when you stay with us. So your residency is state-of-the-art as well, and also new. Um, the residency opened one year earlier in December of 19. Because of COVID, we got delayed on the master building for a year. But it's still, it's absolutely, it's brand new residentials. And the working professionals stay in Block C, which is set up as a hotel-style residence. And so a lot of the times we get asked, should we consider doing the MBA during COVID or just wait for COVID? And our response is, don't wait, just jump in. Because when the economy takes off after COVID, you want to be prepared and ready to be engaged and ready to grow quickly as the economy takes off. And certainly Malaysia is a good example of this. Right now, people are in lockdown. But when COVID is solved and everyone has their jabs, the economy here is going to take off and roar like a lion. But we do look very closely at your safety. And safety is first in every single decision we make. Some of the decisions we've made have had to be painful, like delaying the sessions that we would normally have had in certain dates. So we've had to delay some travel, but we make certain, we know that travel is super important and we make certain that it's still available to you. We do not take it away. It's still a key part of the program. As well as we make certain that um, the, the learning outcomes remain the same, regardless of whether you're taking a class online or you're taking it in person. And we do try to work very closely with hybrid learning because we want everybody that can come in to come into class. But if you don't particularly feel safe, we want to make certain that you have a safety option as well. So you don't feel forced to do something that you are uncomfortable with. All right. And then with the learning in action as well, 
with COVID right now, businesses are growing, they're changing rapidly, or they're having to completely restructure everything that they're doing to be able to stay profitable and succeed and grow. And this is where the learning and action comes into play. As several of our students have been trusted with new responsibilities and expanded roles and given the opportunity to shine because of business changing so rapidly. And in addition to that, we actually, for uh, most of our students do come corporate sponsored, but for those that aren't corporate sponsored, don't worry. We do have actually one of uh, the leading um, global financial aid packages that are available. And we do work with you for uh, self-sponsored students for financial aid. Okay, and there's opportunities available and uh, our admissions team can talk you through that at length or we can all hop on a call with you at a different time and have that conversation. But the important takeaway from today is financial aid is available. So with this, I wanna to get to the real heart of this presentation, which is applying to the MBA program. And I wanna pass it to my colleague, Fazilla, who's gonna lead you through this. Thank you. Awesome, thank you for the overview, Jules. Um, it's really great having all of you here tonight. Uh, welcome, I know some of you just hopped in a bit late. Um, it's a pity you missed Jules' presentation, but um, you will receive the link to the recording after this session. So um, could we like move on to the next one, please? Right, so nitty gritty of the application uh, process. So our deadline is coming right up. It's on June 15th, 2021. Um, so I would advise all of you, if you haven't yet started your application, do so right now. Even if you think that, you know, you have plenty of time to do it, don't. One tip I will give you early on um, is that it always takes you, it, not always, but sometimes it takes you longer than you think it will. So if you start early, you have a better idea of what the application requires, and then you can plan accordingly. I've known people to complete the application in one or two days. It's definitely possible, but you do want, um, if I were you, I would prefer to start early so that you kind of know what's ahead of you. So the minimum requirements for our application are, um, as Juliana mentioned, um, there's a bachelor's degree or equivalent. For Malaysian applicants, we do accept the APEL certification. If you're not quite sure what it is, just reach out to us. Our contact details will be up on the screen at the end of the presentation. Um, the minimum requirement is two years work experience post bachelor's degree graduation. And we also require a proof of English language proficiency. Don't worry about it. If your degree was taught in English, that serves as proof to us of English language proficiency. If not, then you may need to take um, an English test such as IELTS or TOEFL or the Pearson test. We accept a variety of tests. If you're not sure, again, reach out to us. Um, next slide, please. Um, these are the application components. Our application is entirely online. Um, when you log in, you'll need to fill in the form. And there are a few things you need to upload, such as your resume, cover letter, academic transcripts, and degree certificate. Um, there will be an essay. Uh, there's a video statement, um, two recommendations. Um, and we do accept test scores, such as the GMAT, the GRE, or the executive assessment. But these are um, optional, so don't worry if you don't have them. And then once you submit, um, we'll read your application. Uh, if we find your um, application or your candidacy compelling, we will reach out to you um, to ask you to log in uh, a time for interview. Um, next slide, please. So this is like some tip and tricks, like overview. So for the resume, a lot of you like want to put everything and some people reach out to me and say like, oh my goodness, two pages. How can I fit 10 years work experience in two pages? Trust me, it's possible. Um, you can just do your search online and focus on your achievement here. Yeah? So we want to see what impact you've brought, what, uh, you know, if there are successful projects or initiatives that you spearheaded, what's the bottom line, like list them out in your resume. Uh, we also require a cover letter. Basically, we want you to answer these two questions, why ASD? Um, why do you want to do your MBA at ASD? Why now? And 
why you? What do you bring to the table? What can you contribute to the cohort at ASD? And then there's a little video. So please don't panic. Like, oh my goodness, video, I'll need to get a crew or anything. Nope. Your phone is good enough. So all we want to do is, uh, what we want is that we want uh, you to introduce yourself to the ESD community. Um, so basically follow the instructions. That's the big tip number two, follow the instructions. Um, next slide, please. I'll go into detail into more of these tips. Um, also for recommenders, um, don't um, reach out to the president of your company to ask him or her for a recommendation when you've never worked with them before. So we want people who recommend you to know you and have worked at length with you and they can give us specific examples about how you are at work. So um, people who know you, uh, we prefer one person to be a boss, the other person can also be another boss or your colleague or your vendor or your mentor or your peer. So these people are, accept, uh, are accepted. And also uh, for the academics, we would like you to have, uh, to upload your official transcript and also degree certificates. If you don't upload your degree certificate, we're gonna chase you until you, you, give, you send us a copy. And then after that, when you get to the interviews, um, it will be a behavioral type interview. Uh, we want you to be authentic and be yourself. Now, the thing with a lot of people from you know, certain regions, like my own culture as well, um, I'm Malaysian, Sometimes we're a bit too reserved when it comes to interviews, or we try to give answers that are so, uh, you know, from a book. They're too generic, you know? It is so obviously not something that you feel or you think. So we want to hear from you. We want to know your opinions and your values. So please uh, be ready, be prepared to communicate these uh, during the interview. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, so this is the form part. Um, your personal employment information is what we require. So it should be straightforward, match your resume. Um, like I mentioned, a brief description of your responsibilities, but we actually also want to know what impact you have had. And if you, and uh, we would like to see a sense of purpose. Uh, one of the best, uh, the best applications I've read are those that have a strong sense of purpose emanating from the entire application. You know, the whole application makes sense, uh, but it's okay to be unsure of your future plans, but do indicate which direction you're currently interested in. Um, next slide, please. So I mentioned the statement of purpose and cover letter, why now, why you want this MBA. Um, don't say something generic like, I wanna be a better manager. I want to use this MBA to become, uh, you know, to to get more skill set. Oh, it does not really tell us who you are. So I guess I should also mention that the whole purpose of this application process is for us to get to know you. And it's a two-way process, right? We want to get to know you and you also want to get to know us. I mean, I like to say an MBA is usually like a marriage. Um, we hope that we get married once. So we want to make this one count, right? Uh, and we also want to hear about you, uh, your examples of achievement as well. Don't be shy about, uh, you know, talking about your achievements. I know sometimes certain cultures, you know, we like to be humble. We don't like to brag. Uh, please don't brag, but don't be shy about stating facts, right? If you really help your company save a million ringgit during the pandemic, Say it, provide examples, provide uh, evidence. Uh, we, that's what we wanna hear from you. Um, next slide, please. Um, essay. Uh, so we used to have two essays, but actually uh, we only want one, one essay. So uh, some of the essay prompts uh, will require, us, uh, require you to give us some examples. So uh, please, don't be shy, give us um, details. Uh, the chronology should be clear, you know, what happened, talk about what you did, what impact you had. Uh, don't overuse like I or we, and everything should be on one page. Um, next please, page please. Um, your resume, I mentioned it before, uh, it should not exceed two pages. 
Um, so I wanted to highlight there's a difference between a resume and a CV. Please don't upload your CV. A CV has all of your uh, all of the things that you did in detail. We don't really want detail. You're applying for an MBA program. We want to know what your achievements are, what roles you have had. We want to see the chronology of your professional journey. Um, and if there are gaps, you know, like sometimes people take time off, uh, you know, a few months or even a year. Some people, you know, they um, have children and they take a career break. Um, be honest to us about it. Um, if there are gaps, please explain them. There is a space called the optional essay uh, in the application. I would suggest you use uh, this space to explain any career gaps or anything at, else, uh, anything at all that you'd like to bring to the attention of the admissions committee. So we'd like to see your entire career and all of the experiences you have had. Um, next, please. Transcripts and degree certificates, these should be PDF copies or images. Um, for the application, we require the soft copy. Um, if you've paid, taken any other courses, uh, they are particularly quantitative, quantitative in nature. Let's say you've taken a data analytics course or statistics course or finance courses, you have a CFA or you have maybe a project management um, certificate or Six Sigma, whatever it is that you have or ACCA, uh, please upload the evidence as well. Um, if your transcripts are not in English, please have them translated into English. Uh, we would appreciate um, an official English transla uh, translation. Uh, but if you have any questions at all, you can just uh, contact us directly. Um, next slide. Recommendations, it's a form. So don't go to your recommenders and ask them for a letter. Uh, we don't want that. So basically what happens is that you log into the application, you fill in the details for your recommenders. We will email them directly and ask them to fill in a recommendation form online. So like I mentioned, choose someone who knows you very well and can speak of your achievements and uh, give specific examples of your work. Um, and uh, please manage your recommenders' expectations. So it's a form, they fill in the form, and then there's space at the end for them to write about you. I've had you know, amazing applicants, but their recommenders only wrote like five sentences about them. Um, to me, uh, maybe they weren't aware of what we wanted from uh, an, MA, an MBA recommendation letter. So please, like, when you choose uh, your recommender, give them a heads up, let them know that, hey, are you okay uh, with me um, nominating you as my recommender? Um, if you could, please like write, there's space at the end, please write about me and give specific examples. So you want to give them a little heads up and have a little chat, you know, like people are taking uh, their time out uh, to write a recommendation for you. So you do want to like, uh, manage the relationship well. So please note that if you uh, only one recommender submits or no recommendations are submitted, your application is not considered complete and we will not be able to move forward with your application. Next, so the interview right now because of COVID, um, everyone is just interviewed by Zoom. So the interview is 45 minutes in length. Uh, with a member of the admissions committee, um, it's about fit. Um, what will you contribute to the program and cohort? Why is this the, prog uh, the right program and the right time for you? So we will um, ask you about stuff that you wrote on your application, but also we will ask you behavioral questions. Uh, we do cover this a bit in our uh, MBA FAQs. You're free to look that up, and you can also look up what behavioral type interviews are. I won't discuss them here, but please be prepared to answer these type of questions. Um, next, please. So top things to remember. So we want to have, I think you need to click through, Joe. Be specific when writing the essays. Ask someone to review your writing. So my husband applied for an MBA program. He got admitted to MIT Sloan. I became his person to review your writing. And before you ask, no, I will not review your essays. 
if you're applying to ASB. I've had people ask me that question before, so I'll also bring it out here. Like, no, I'm not going to do that. For you, you are welcome to reach out to someone who knows you uh, and whom you have confidence in to give you feedback about your essay and your cover letter and your resume. Recommenders, like I mentioned, uh, please give them a heads up. They can meet your deadline and can tell us about you and about your professional growth. And the process, keep us updated. We are, Jules and I will share our contact details. If you're applying, if you have questions, please reach out to us. We are on LinkedIn, we're on email, we're on WhatsApp. I mean, you can just reach out to us uh, and we'll be happy to help. Um, yep, the big thing is why ASB? Like, you have to be very clear about, you know, which is why we have Jules give the program overview. You, we want you to get to know us and be sure about, you know, that we are the school for you. So you should be able to communicate this very clearly throughout the application and if you're selected to move forward during the interview as well. Oh yeah, holler at me. Like I mentioned, there's the LinkedIn, there's my email. If you drop me um, an email when you when I reply to you, you can see my contact details. Feel free to reach out, like scan all the codes. And we also have Jules' contact details as well. Holler at Jules. She's also on LinkedIn and um, email and WhatsApp. So we're very happy to help. Uh, please don't be shy. Please reach out to us with questions you may have. And remember, the deadline is June 6th, uh, June 15th. If for whatever reason you need an extension, please reach out to us. We'll be, uh, we may be able to consider it. Uh, we do have to like check with the admissions committee before we grant any extensions. But uh, whatever your problems are, please reach out to us. I think that's the end of my presentation. So I'd like to open it to questions. I think uh, Jules has done a fantastic uh, job of reaching out to people. Okay, answering questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, English language test, that's true. For Malaysian applicants, generally we don't require uh, an English language test. Uh, and so we will use the interview and the application to assess your English language proficiency. Oh yeah, we will call you out <laughs> if you have followed directions. Application directions are very important. So read them, follow them. Um, I definitely have read applications before and always written a little note like, hmm, this applicant has not followed in, uh, instructions. So the program cost, uh, Jules has kindly answered that. So we do have financial aid avail available. So the process of financial aid begins after you are accepted to the program. So please do apply. Uh, and then the process for financial aid will begin afterwards. Um, we do rolling admissions in the background. So you don't need to wait until June 15th, submit your application. If your application is ready tomorrow, submit. If it's ready next week, Submit. We'll begin processing your application um, as soon as we can. Yep, it's much better to have recommendation from someone who knows you well. Uh, yes, and there's the application link. Why do you should reach out to recommenders? Yeah, we will send them uh, an application form to fill in via email. So, but before that, you can like give them a little bit of heads up, but you don't need to ask them for a recommendation letter because we will handle that part uh, by, by ourselves. What makes a video statement stand out? That is a great question. I will refer back to the application instructions. So for the video, we want you to introduce yourself to the ASB admissions commu uh, ASB community. And you should also communicate uh, about yourself. So video statements are one of my the favorite parts of uh, reading an application because you do get to see the personality of the person behind the paper. Um, so uh, tell us a bit about yourself. You can be a little bit more informal in the uh, in the video statement, but also um, some examples are I've had people uh, video themselves themselves at work. I've had people video themselves while they are traveling to work. 
I've had people video themselves in many different locations and tie them in into a narrative. So it really depends on what you want to present to, to us. The most important thing is don't exceed two minutes. You don't need to have a production crew or you know put music. Please don't put music uh, unless you're very sure about what you're doing because I've had videos whereby I couldn't hear uh, what the person was saying. Uh, so it's all about communication. What impression do you want to send to us? Because why the application is so involved is that we want to get to know you from a holistic point of view. We want to get to know you like, who are you as a person? What are your values? What can you contribute to the program? Because as you've seen from Joe's presentation, we do value diversity. So we don't want to admit a whole class of people who are the same, with the same background, the same experiences. We want diversity. So we want to know, like, what do you bring to the classroom? What if my undergraduate is not economic? No problem. Well, we stayed a bachelor's degree. We have people admitted to the program who are engineers doctors, pharmacists, lawyers, um, graduated in economics, finance, even linguistics. So it doesn't matter what your undergraduate degree is. When could I complete the program? It takes 22 months. We begin every year in August and graduate in May. Um, yep. Do you offer this program online? Oh my goodness. Um, so some parts, of the program could be online due to COVID, but as Jules mentioned, we aim to be in person. Yeah, so with the MBA for Working Professionals, our goal is for in person. However, with that said, we are very aware of the amount of time that's required outside of work. So you will have a few classes that are run as uh, online classes, especially in your core classes taught by our local faculty. And then during COVID, we've been forced to do things either hybrid or online for the sake of your safety. So we will always take your safety first, but you cannot plan that this is an online degree and not plan time out of the office. You have to assume that you need the full time out of the office, and then occasionally we can surprise you and require less. Does that answer your question at all? Okay, perfect, thank you. Yes, uh, Harman Preet, yes, please do get in touch with Pratiga. Uh, she's the best person on our team to guide you through this conversation with your employer um, in order for uh, sponsorship purposes. Do we have any other questions? You're also welcome to uh, like speak uh, if you're not really great or if you don't want to type. You can unmute yourself. The quick answer to that, Bernolo, is most likely not. Uh, without looking at your uh, academic transcripts, I say it's highly likely that you don't need an English language uh, proficiency test. But do uh, you can get in touch with me afterwards and uh, maybe uh, let me know which university you graduated from and maybe send me a copy of a degree certificate for me to be able to give a more accurate answer. Okay, it seems that um, no one has any more questions. Oh, here's an, here are a couple more. Uh, but some of us... I can feel that one. So if you change jobs during the program, it's really between you and your company if you're corporate sponsored. If you're self-sponsored, then to us it doesn't really matter. And in fact, we've actually had students change um, jobs in the program. So it's very doable. The one thing that I strongly, strongly, strongly urge you to do when you're negotiating with a company, if you're changing jobs during the program, make certain that you negotiate the time off for the degree. Because if you forget to do that and then you start and they realize the amount of times, a lot of times it will push back if it's not pre-negotiated ahead of time. If you lose your job, well, that's not ideal. We are certainly not going to throw you out of the program. 
Okay, our goal is to work with you to help you find the next job. And of course, what we should say is we talked a lot about the professional development skills, okay? Because most of our students do come corporate sponsored. And if you're corporate sponsored, we're not encouraging you to find another job. But if you are self-sponsored and you are looking to change jobs, you have full access to all the resources the full-time MBA students have for job hunting and for career placement and all the, the coaching for finding new jobs as well. So if you do lose your job, we do have the safety net and resources here to help you as you look for your next job. And there is a question about the financial ability. Like uh, we mentioned, there is a financial aid option. Uh, we are actually market leaders when it comes to financial aid when, uh, for MBA programs. But uh, for the MBAWP students, the process kicks in after admissions. So the first thing you need to do is to apply to ASB, get admitted and then the financial uh, aid process will begin. So I'd like to also say that uh, financial aid is something that we have for this year. For next year, we're uncertain of what financial aid uh, we are able to offer. So if that's something that's important to you, then maybe it's worthwhile for you to consider applying this year rather than next year. And then there was a question on the classes, if you can choose the courses you signed up for, if it's fixed. So how this works is you get through class and the program as a cohort. So especially in the first year as you're focusing on core classes, these will be fixed times and fixed offerings and the classes are offered once a year. Um, where you get flexibility is in year two when you start taking the formal electives. So I think there's something like 20, 25 different electives to pick and you need to take four of them. So you can take a mixture of what's good for your time as well as what you're passionate about learning and you can figure out your schedule accordingly. And then of course, don't forget with the electives, even though it's only four required, you can take as many as you want. And as part of the alumni benefits as well, we strongly encourage you to come back and take classes. You can take them without tuition at all. You just will have to pay a little fee to cover your materials. And I do wanna say one thing we, that we didn't address. We talked about the cost of tuition because it was in the chat that someone asked specifically about the cost of tuition. But what we did not talk about was what the tuition includes, okay? Because it's not just tuition and you're done. But the tuition is basically all encompassing. Um, it, it covers your, obviously your tuition for your classes, but it includes usage of the textbooks as well as all of your course materials that you need while you're doing the program. It includes when you go to MIT, your housing at MIT. It would be take an optional check, it includes your housing for the trek. What you will need to pay for if you come through ASB is you will need to pay for your airline ticket to MIT. If you live abroad and you fly in to take the program, then you would need to pay for your airline ticket to come here for the residency weeks. But if you're Malaysian, then that's obviously a cost you do not bear. Um, you pay for your airline ticket to MIT. You pay for your airline ticket if you wanna do any of the optional treks but otherwise all the costs pretty much are included in there. So when we send people to MIT, what we tell them to prepare for is you have to pay for your incidentals, you have to pay for your cost of food, but for the most part, everything else is covered in it. So it's all inclusive and it does not nickel and dime you as you go through the program. Let's see, and the email. So, Fazilla's email is actually on the slide in front of me right now. And, um, and I can flip through and I can also share with mine as well. And we very much would love to hear from you and uh, love to respond. If you did not want to ask questions in a public forum, we're very happy to answer individually as well. So please don't hesitate to reach out. For Haman tweets question, the application must be before 15th June. Yes, that's the deadline that we have. Uh, financial aid is for people who are admitted into the program and who are not corporate sponsored usually, but um, let's get in touch and discuss. But if you uh, require an extension, we may be able to grant, uh, you know, maybe a few days or maybe it depends on our workload, but we can't grant too much, uh, too many, too much time. Uh, because as you know, the program starts in August, right? So we want to give admissions decisions as fast as possible so that uh, you'll have time to make arrangements uh, to start the program in August. If I can make one recommendation, the application itself does take some time. 
and people always want longer than what they than what, what's given. However, with that said, I've seen this application done as fast as 24 hours. So you can do it quickly if you need to. The reason that we encourage you to take longer so that you can think through your answers more and be more clear in your thoughts, but you can do this quickly if you want. And the reason this is very important is because your recommenders usually take more time than you plan. So if you hit the submit button and then your, app, your recommenders get their notice when you submit your application for the first time on the deadline, then you're gonna need an extension for them to be able to write the recommendations and get it in, and you won't be able to give them much time. But if you wanna circumvent that and make certain you're ahead of that, you can always go in the application and enter in your recommender's information and hit send to that while you continue to work on your application so that they have the time that they need as well as you have the time that you need. That's an excellent point, Jules. Thank you for bringing that up. Definitely do that once you've identified your recommender and you're sure that these are the people you want. Go to the application, fill in their details, uh, key in their details so that we can reach out to them while you are still completing your application. Please try and aim to give your recommenders as much time as possible because you know sometimes recommenders are busy, they have work deadlines, We've even had recommenders come down with COVID, so they were in the hospital. You know, you don't know what's going to happen, so it's best to give uh, as much time as possible for your recommenders as a courtesy and also to make things easier for you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. The full meaning of the MBA WP program is this MBA for working professionals. And you will hear us say the MBA FT, which is the MBA for full-time residents as well, for full-time students. So with that, let me come back here and I'll leave you with Fizzilla's information. There you go. Okay, it's 8.54 p.m. Um, last call for questions. Nope, okay, I guess that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so um, I'm glad that you made it to our webinar tonight. I hope that we've given you, you know, more insight about uh, ASD, about the program, and about applying to ASD. Any questions, please feel free to uh, get in touch. Um, there's my LinkedIn there. Feel free to connect or send me messages. Say that you attended this webinar and maybe you'd like to keep in touch.